Hello, and welcome to the next installment in the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Networks Liberating Webinar Series. My name is Lydia XZ Brown, sign name L Brown, pronouns they, them. I'm a youngish East Asian person with short black and teal hair, currently wearing a dark zipper pull pullover, and behind me is a blurred room with a bunch of stuff on the wall so you don't see the mess. I'm AWN's Director of Policy, Advocacy, and External Affairs, and I'm really excited for today's conversation, which will focus on prison abolition at the intersections of food, health, and disability justice. I'm excited today to introduce our guests. First, I would like to introduce Andrea James, JD, founder and executive director of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls, founder of Families for Justice as Healing, author of Upper Bunkies Unite and Other Thoughts on the Politics of Mass Incarceration. I have your book, it's on my shelf out there. A 2015 Soros Justice Fellow, and recipient of the 2016 Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Award. As a former criminal defense attorney and a formerly incarcerated woman, Andrea shares her personal and professional experiences to raise awareness of the effect of incarceration of women on themselves, their children, and communities. Her work is focused on ending incarceration of women and girls and contributing to the shift from a criminal legal system focused on police and prisons to a system led by directly affected people from within their communities and based on individual and community accountability. Second, before I make the second introduction, uh, someone mentioned they don't see the closed captioning on our Zoom menu bar. If you don't see it immediately, there's a button that says more with three dots. And if you click that, it should then appear for you. Our second guest is Taylor Noivel, founder and executive director of Who Speaks For Me. Who Speaks For Me is a national nonprofit that Taylor designed while incarcerated. During her four and a half years in federal prison, Taylor spent her time assisting other incarcerated people with preparing internal grievances, as well as pro se motions for post-conviction relief. Who Speaks For Me was born from the stories of the women Taylor did time with. Who Speaks For Me works to raise awareness about the intersection of trauma and the rise in incarceration rates among women, girls, and LGBTQ people with a focus on BIPOC and aims to interrupt and dismantle the trauma to prison pipeline, a concept Taylor is credited with creating. Taylor is a queer, black, cis woman. She is a mother, writer, advocate, activist, and public speaker. Taylor holds a bachelor's in English literature and things have been published in the Washington Post, Talk Poverty, The Nation, the Vera Institute for Justice blog, and Ms. Magazine online. Next, I'd like to introduce Kanav Kathuria. Kanav's work lies in the intersection of abolitionism, public health, and food sovereignty. He's a 2019 Open Society Institute Baltimore Community Fellow and co-founder of the Maryland Food and Prison Abolition Project, a Baltimore-based organization that connects urban and small-scale farms to prisons to use food as a tool for resistance. And last, but not least, I'd like to introduce Gabriel Arclas, an attorney and writer based in Brooklyn, New York. He is senior counsel at the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund, where he litigates in defense of trans and non-binary communities. He also serves on the steering committee of the Muslim Alliance for Sexual and Gender Diversity and the board of HERD. And with his long-term collaborator, Pooja Gehi, P-O-O-J-A, G-E-H-I. He is co-founder of the Alyssa Rodriguez Center for Gender Justice. Oh, I didn't know about that. Congratulations. 
Thank you. Information that I learned just from sharing everybody's bios out loud. Just as a reminder, as we get started, uh, you should now be able to access the closed captioning by clicking on the bottom bar for CC, and then it will appear on your screen as show subtitle, or if you prefer to view full transcript. There is also a link that Nancy has posted into the chat if you prefer to access the captioning on a separate screen. You should be able to see an ASL interpreter on screen. If at any time you're having trouble with access, please let us know in the chat, and one of our team members will do our best to try to address the issue immediately. First, as we get started, I'd like to ask if each of you would tell us a little bit about your work and how it relates to prison abolition at these intersections of racial and gender justice and food and health and disability justice. For me, it seems really obvious how all of these movements and struggles are connected, but that might not be true for some folks who are tuning in for the first time today. So I will uh, turn this over to Andrea if you would kick us off. Well, thank you and thank you to all of the other panelists and for the audience here who cares about this issue. Oh, Andrea, we are currently not hearing you if you're speaking. Hmm. I'm unmuted. Can you hear me now? Nope. It shows that you're unmuted, but there yeah. is no I can hear her. sound. Oh, wait, try that again. How about now? Yes, I hear you now. That might have been my issue. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you again to all the other panelists and Thank you, Lydia, and, and everybody for the invitation to come here today and to talk about this very important issue. Our work started in uh, sitting in a prison, uh, the Federal Prison for Women in Danbury, Connecticut. And um, we made a, we were determined, it was 2010 and uh, lots of discussion was happening around the country to uh, end what was referred to then as mass incarceration. Um, there was uh, Michelle Alexander's book that was incredibly profound and in shifting awareness in the country about the need uh, to pay attention to the issue of incarceration. There was also uh, our comrade uh, Piper Kerman's book um, that was a very uh, a particular book about her life and her experience. And there was also a scathing report that came out from the uh, Center for uh, Media Democracy, who uh, taught us about ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, and the Koch Brother Network um, uh, as the architects of, of mass incarceration. From 1996 to 2008, we built a prison in this country every 10 days, and we crammed it full of Black, Brown, and poor people. Imagine if we had built a school and invested that money in our children's education. Imagine if we had built housing um, and, and, and food and, and all of these other things, uh, 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 close the digital divide, all of these things that we could have done. But in this country, uh, the powers decided to build a prison every 10 days. And so this is some of the work that we're doing to, to stop or to dismantle. And we made a, a pact in the prison yard that we were gonna organize ourselves as incarcerated women. We did do that. I was the only one at the time who was allowed to leave the prison. I was organizing with women who literally had been in prison for 20 years or more. And um, they weren't sure when they were gonna come out. We did fight. We got each of our leadership circle out um, along with 50 other women uh, under the Obama administration who were serving a life with no parole sentences for drugs. Um, and we went about the work of trying to figure out first, and that took us years of how to operationalize the, the audacious goal that we set for ourselves in that prison in 2010 to end the incarceration of women and girls. And uh, we did years, two and a half years of listening tours around the country. Uh, and then we did a, a 35 community uh, town hall on the same day in July of 2018, and then dumped all that information, participatory research on the table. And that uh, informed us of how we developed our second bucket of work. We work in three buckets, policy, legal, we sue prisons, we do all kinds of stuff. Uh, we, we motion for, for compassionate release and for clemency, state and federal. And then our second bucket, which is the most important bucket to us is called reimagining communities. And all of that participatory research came out of that for food justice, for anything but prisons. And how do we 
begin to build these things separate from any government entity, state, federal, uh, county, any government entity. How do we um, lead in our own neighborhoods um, uh, through a people's assembly process uh, to figure out how do we incorporate participatory defense, transformative justice, again, people's assembly, basic income guarantee, mutual aid, hydroponic farms, all of these things that we now are building in our reimagining communities that are led by the people. And so um, our work as, ab as prison abolitionists um, directly connects to our work of reimagining re re our communities. Um, and I'll end by just saying that all of our work uh, is led by our sisters who are still inside. They are at the first and the front of the decision-making processes and the strategy processes that they then uh, funnel out uh, that we pick up and, and build upon. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that, Andrea, and for all of the work that you're doing. Um, I'll turn to Taylor next. Hi, I'm Taylor Nouvelle, uh, she, her. I am a African-American brown-skinned woman. So sorry. I thought I had my phone on Do Not Disturb. I'm very sorry. It is on Do Not Disturb, but somehow it comes through the computer. Um, so let's just turn the phone off. How about that? Um, but it still might come through. Um, I am a brown skinned African American woman. I'm wearing red frame glasses. I have on a dark lipstick. There is a fake virtual bookcases behind me. I'm wearing a black sweater with a printed shirt with multi colors and pink and, and black and diamonds. It's asymmetrical things. And I have a little tassel on me. Um, and I have on some hoop earrings that are silver. Um, so Who Speaks for Me, as uh, Lydia stated in the beginning, is a um, prison abolitionist activist organization that focuses on um, the rise and incarceration, the intersections of the rise of incarceration rates amongst women, girls, and LGBTQ people um, and trauma. And um, women are the fastest growing prison population, jail, the largest growing population of people who are incarcerated in this country. Um, and there is a direct link between trauma and that growth in incarceration rates. While I was incarcerated, I did a lot of work as a, what they call a jailhouse lawyer, but um, I'm not a lawyer, I'm a paralegal by trade. Um, but um, during this time, I spent a lot of time reading people's pre-sentencing reports, which is something that goes to the judge after you've been convicted or take a plea. It's supposed to aid in sentencing to reduce, you know, it's, it's basically a mitigation report, but that's not what it's used for. It's used to take any and everything that's ever happened to you in your life to say you are a criminal, that you will always be a criminal, and there is nothing to change this because basically your trauma has led you to be this criminal. And um, while I was incarcerated, before I would do what a system with a pro se motion, which means you're representing yourself, you don't have an attorney. Before I would take a case, I would ask to see the pre-sentencing report. And what stuck out to me and almost all, and I did a couple hundred cases in the four and a half years that I was incarcerated, what stuck out to me and struck me as horrible was that we all had some major traumatic event prior to incarceration. And that could be um, sexual violence, it could be caregiver violence, domestic violence, poverty, um, growing up in violent neighborhoods, being unhoused. It was a, a, a very variety of things, but the common thread was trauma. And so um, while I was incarcerated, you know, I, I saw this and I started thinking about it and I designed the program and I knew I was going to call it Who Speaks For Me. And the name Who Speaks For Me comes from the fact that this is where we get into disability. And I focus primarily on mental health disability because it's an, most mental health disabilities are non-apparent. And um, people don't look at you and say, oh, you have a disability. Um, while we, we incorporate everyone, we focus on the mental health that comes from being tra from trauma. And um, often while I was incarcerated, they would use suicide watch because suicide watch is way more dehumanizing than being put in a segregated housing unit. You're stripped of all your clothing, including your underwear. You're put in a big gown that we call a turtle suit. And you're put inside of a room that has bright lights 24 hours and you're watched. You have to ask to go to the bathroom and you're handcuffed before they come in the room to, to, to 
let you go to the bathroom, you eat your food with your hands, you're not allowed any utensils. And it is just a very degrading, um, mentally damaging, traumatizing event. And um, the last time I was on suicide watch in prison was 2014, a few months before I came home. And I spent three weeks straight, that's 21 days on suicide watch. And while I was there, I thought, who is speaking for me? You're in a silo. You don't know anything. Unlike the SHU, the segregated housing unit, you get no mail, you get no phone calls, they disappear you right there in the middle of thousands of people. No one knows you exist except for those few that come through. And um, I, 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 when I got off of that stint of suicide watch, I was like, I'm either going to live and do something or I'm going to die. And so the work of Who Speaks to Me really speaks to these issues that I saw impacting me and the other women around me. Um, so we do advocacy around um, trauma and creating a trauma-informed justice system. We'll have a conference coming up next spring where we work with the gatekeepers. That's who will be invited. And the gatekeepers, we mean judges, lawyers, defense and prosecutors, mental health workers, social workers, um, chaplains. We just had an event the other day with a chaplain, former chaplain from Alderson Federal Prison Camp. Um, and as well as uh, correctional officers. So the whole point of that is to start the way that we do abolition to create alternatives to incarceration is to raise awareness about trauma and creating alternatives to incarceration. And um, we do that through a variety of things. We have webinars, we have speakers bureau, we have um, a, a writing program for people who are actually system impacted. We do trainings, like I say, and every year we do a fundraiser called Women Cooking in Prison where we actually cook food that we made in prison in the microwave with the food that we could get from commissary or that we stole from the kitchen. And um, the point of that is to one, show how we've been denied access to good food. So you could still chicken, you could still hummus, you could still onions and carrots and fresh vegetables from the kitchen, but you couldn't get that stuff on a daily basis. And you also couldn't get it at the commissary. So it's a blend of like what is offered and what you have to get from commissary and how you make these meals. And the important thing is to say, food is important. Food is community, food, denying access to good food when someone is incarcerated is, um, it's tantamount to cruel and unusual punishment. Giving garbage to people who have been locked away is telling us that we are garbage. So we do a lot around food justice. We're working with DC um, Justice Labs here in DC around that and Impact Justice as well. They've done a complete report um, food justice in the jails and prisons and their pilot program is here in DC. But the thing that's always missing from all of these reports, looking at these intersectionalities and things is women and queers, right? Everyone wants to talk about men in prison, right? When we do hear about queers, we hear about trans women. We don't hear about trans masculine people in women's prisons. We don't hear about cis lesbians like myself in prisons. And we rarely talk about the mental health component of it when we talk about disability because there is that stigma. And so this is what we seek to do to raise awareness, to destigmatize and to create alternatives to incarceration by creating a trauma lens of those that have the power as well as the community members. When you can raise that compassion and show people that, you know, um, when you look at me, you, you can see somebody like you, you can see yourself. Maybe, you know, if I'm willing and those that are coming along on this journey with me to understand the intersections of, um, poverty, trauma, poverty as trauma, actually, you know, thinking about poverty as trauma, looking at those as, um, tools of the oppressors that cause us to be on this trauma to prison pipeline. If we can begin to dismantle those systems and interrupt them, then we can ease, we can start seeing an impact on the decarceration rates. And that's, I think, all I need to say. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Taylor. Um, I will turn to Gabrielle next. I know that you have previously worked, Gabrielle, representing trans people who were incarcerated. Uh, I'm assuming trans women as well as trans men and non-binary people, although I don't necessarily know it because all the folks were that you had been working with. Um, but would you be able to talk a bit about your work and what it looks like at the intersections? Sure. Um, so I'm Gabriel and I am a white person with um, a sort of salt and pepper facial hair and no hair on my head and a headset in front of some bookcases. Um, 
And uh, so uh, most of my work has has focused on trans liberation, trying to um, trying to work with my trans communities. And um, and pretty early on in in taking on that work, it became clear to me that some of the biggest barriers to trans liberation are things like incarceration, homelessness, the concentration of wealth in the hands of a few, immigration restrictions, um, uh, the problems with a with a public benefit systems, like all of these types of things. Um, if we just we're not going to be able to get liberation for trans people without dealing with all those things, right? Um, and trans people are so often caught caught up in these systems that are incredibly, um, what's the word? I guess deadly. Um, and working with trans people in these types of systems, of course, I'm, I'm working with a lot of other disabled trans people too. Um, and mostly, Black and Latinx trans people in my in my particular experience, although not exclusively. Um, but even so, so I have done and I still do. I'm representing um, trans people who are incarcerated around conditions of confinement, um, and you know, often trans people are experiencing particular targeting of them as trans people, but also. Trans people are sometimes experiencing just the same sort of abuse that everyone in prison experiences or um, are being targeted for multiple reasons, or it's hard to tell exactly why they're targeted, right? Um, and it became clear to me pretty early on in this work that equality can't be the goal. I mean, if, if we get to a place where incarcerated trans people are only getting assaulted or placed in solitary as often as cis people are, that would certainly be a huge improvement, but it's not what I think anyone could really call liberation. Um, so that's what brought brought me as an individual to, um, to thinking about abolition as a framing for, for the work that I do. Um, but even when I'm working on trans issues that seem like they wouldn't necessarily involve the criminal legal system, they often do because the system infiltrates so many different parts of life. Um, so, for example, I do work on access to identity documents for trans people, um, so name change or being able to change the gender marker on ID or to be able to get ID at all. Um, and so one of my recent cases was in Pennsylvania where um, people with certain felony convictions can never change their name. It's a lifetime bar, or it was. Um, and others um, were barred until two years after they finished their sentence. Um, and uh, so we challenged we challenged that law and, and we won name changes for some formerly incarcerated trans people. Um, and in Alabama, I have a case that challenges um, Alabama's policy of requiring trans people to get surgery. Um, to be able to change the gender marker on ID, um, specifically on driver's licenses. I mean, incarcerated people can't hold their own driver's licenses, so you would think it, there would not be that much tie-in, but there is. The state's entire defense is that they have to list trans people based on assigned sex at birth unless they undergo genital surgery, because otherwise um, they might treat trans women as if they were women, trans men as if they were men when they are arrested or incarcerated. Um, so in order to in order to do what they want to do to trans people on the assumption that they're going to get arrested, they are going to require you to get surgery. And then at the same time, Alabama is strongly considering passing a law that would make getting any form of gender affirming care, um, getting or giving any form of gender affirming care, a felony um, in Alabama for anyone under the age of 19. Um, so you'll go to prison if you get or give the type of care that you might need under the age of 19. And if you don't get a very specific type of care that you may or may not need, um, 
then you're going to be classified based on your assigned sex at birth when they arrest and incarcerate you. Um, and it's not just Alabama. I mean, in New York City, back in 2006, we were trying to change the birth certificate rules here. And they initially were very reluctant because they were concerned that being able to change the sex on one's birth certificate would make it easier for terrorists to evade capture, if you can believe it. Um, and when we eventually got them past that barrier, um, they then uh, uh, they then told us they couldn't make the change because the corrections department had contacted them and said they were worried about classifying trans people who got arrested and brought to jail. Um, and they finally did change it, but it it was it was years later. Um, so <clears throat> so. Um, so in a lot of different ways, all of these things are tied together. I, I realize I haven't talked much explicitly about disability and food. Um, I kind of love that the questions are together um, because food I tend not to think about as much, although I probably should. Um, but it is related to all these different types of things. Like one of my clients right now in Miami, he was arrested at a Black Trans Lives Matter vigil and um, abused while while. She, they were held in jail. Um, they, you know, the the trauma from that experience and in combination with their other disabilities um, led them to not eat for a really prolonged period of time and lose a ton of weight. Um, some of my first, I remember one of the first people I worked with in a prison, um, he, uh, he had diabetes and it was, um, he had diabetes, he was getting no treatment for it at all. And um, he had seen a specialist who told him that he was going to have to get an amputation soon if he didn't get his diabetes under control. Um, but the only resource they gave him to do that was yelling at him to quit smoking. He was, uh, without giving him any help with smoking cessation, and he was trying so hard to get a different diet because the diet that you typically get is, is very high in those simple carbohydrates that are hard on you if you're diabetic. And they wouldn't even give him a modified diet. I was fighting and fighting and fighting with the prison just to get him a diet that would let him have a little bit better chance of keeping his foot. Um, so, um, so I do think that all these issues are very intimately tied together in a lot of different ways. Thank you so much for sharing that, Gabriel. Um, last but not least, um, Kanav. Hey, peace, y'all. Um, my name is Kanav Katuria, uh, he, him pronouns. Um, first, yeah, thank you. Just to echo everyone's sentiments. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you to fellow panelists for sharing as well. Um, uh, I'm a, a South Asian uh, man. Um, I am wearing a uh, brown kurta um, against a tapestry um, of various different colors. Um, I have short to medium hair um, and a, a black beard. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about our work at Food and Abolition. Um, I won't get into our origins as much. Um, you know, I might address that later, but to begin, um, as Lydia shared, you know, our work is really rooted at the intersection of food sovereignty and abolition with the goal of using food um, as a tool of resistance. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, so we started in 2018 and we really look at a few things, one being food conditions on the inside in Maryland state prisons, um, carceral food systems as a whole, and really the relationship between prisons and food apartheid. Um, especially as in the struggle for food justice, um, prisons have traditionally been underanalyzed, kind of cast aside when we're talking about um, what it means to have fresh and accessible and healthy and affordable food for all. Um, so prior to the pandemic, our pilot program um, was centered in Maryland um, on connecting urban and small scale farms in Baltimore City uh, to prisons in the state of Maryland. And our original name was the Farm to Prison Project to kind of reflect this. Um, you know, when the pandemic hit, our pilot um, was shut down. Um, we were operating at the Women's Institute, um, MCIW, um, in Jessup, Maryland. Um, 
which I'll get into a little bit too. But so I think for now, there's a few things that I want to um, get into. Um, first, I'll talk about the role of food on the inside. And, you know, as others have echoed, um, you know, instead of serving as this source of nourishment, whether physical, emotional, spiritual, etc., the purpose of prison food is really to feed as many people on as low of a budget as possible. Um, as of 2018, for example, in Maryland, um, the per day cost to feed a person for all three meals was $3.83 on average, right? That comes down to a buck 27 per meal, um, which changes to, you know, the, the lowest um, per day cost in some prisons it was $2.15, which goes down to just cents per meal. So the quality and quantity of the food is of course gonna be inhumane on this budget, right? And I think looking at the ideological underpinnings of what leads to this, um, we, you know, based on our research um, with formerly incarcerated folks, currently incarcerated folks in prisons throughout the state of Maryland, um, we really point to prison food, um, the, the role of prison food as, as doing three things. One, as an everyday mechanism of control of dehumanization and punishment. Um, two, as a site of exploitation and profit for um, private food service corporations, especially getting into the role of commissary as well. And then three, and most importantly, um, as a form of premature death, um, just due to the long-term impacts that prison food has on people's physical and mental health in particular. Um, and that's something that came up a lot in our work, right? A person who is entering prison in many instances, if not all, is going to leave in worse health, is going to leave with chronic health conditions that they didn't come in with because of the quality of prison food that served, right? And, and this has come up again and again and again. So in terms of physical illnesses, you know, um, heart conditions, diabetes, hypertension, ulcerative colitis, um, acid reflux, you know, the, the list really goes on and on. Um, and, you know, we, we also look at how prison food exacerbates and induces mental health conditions too, especially during COVID-19, um, which I'll get into a little later. Um, you know, and, and we can really trace the origins of carceral food um, with the industrialization of our food system as a whole too, right? Especially after the, the 1970s. And again, you know, we got into this work um, because food systems in this way, weren't really being looked at um, in the same way that we looked at, um, you know, like that folks look at hospital and schools for the same way. Um, and just really looking at the purpose of um, prison food as a source of dehumanization is something that we really wanted to emphasize and draw out. Um, I think the second thing I'll say is that in addition to conditions on the inside, we, we focus on the relationship between prison food and food apartheid, especially looking at Baltimore City. Um, and I think a lot of times, right, um, instead, we, we can't look at these two phenomena as unrelated, right? We have to see them as two interrelated formations of state violence, of violence rooted in racial capitalism and anti-Black violence. Um, I, I think all that to say is that like a similar set of conditions which has produced food apartheid and um, prisons, a similar set of conditions that have produced prisons are the same as the ones that have produced food apartheid. Um, and really seeing prisons as these... Um, a warehouses for a racialized surplus population. So I think just to give a more concrete example, in Baltimore, um, it's it's so well documented that the the same neighborhoods, the same five to ten neighborhoods that are hyper incarcerated, over policed, are the same ones that um, experience food apartheid. Right. So individuals, people are just cycling between these two spaces of carcerality, between prisons and their home neighborhoods. Um, uh, you know, denied access, denied control. Um, and ownership over food systems and fresh, nutritious, affordable foods in each space. Um, so I think just the point I want to center then is, you know, carcerality in this way is not defined to just the physical institutions we call prisons. Um, but looking at it through the lens of food, we see how carcerality extends beyond the walls of confinement, um, ultimately meaning that we can't dismantle one form without the other. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. Um, of course, there's a lot more to get into, um, especially around um, the barriers that folks face, uh, face upon coming home and the ways that leads to food insecurity too. But thank you. This is Lydia. Thank you for sharing all of that. I know that we've all mentioned abolition in various points in our discussion so far. Um, I am committed to the work of abolition. Abolition is an informative principle in my organizing and my advocacy. 
but it might be a newer concept to some of the folks who are here now or who may be watching this later. Could you each talk a little bit about what abolition actually means and how abolition is intersectional? And for this, we're gonna jump back and start this time with Taylor. So to me, abolition is one of those loaded words, right? And um, too often it's weaponized against people and say, you know, you're not, a, especially here in DC where there are gatekeepers everywhere, you're not a prison abolitionist because you don't believe in freeing them all, so to speak, right? For me, prison abolition is not something that can happen overnight. It just, it just isn't. When we say free them all, where are we going to put the people, right? Because we have a housing crisis in this country for poor people. We have a housing crisis for returning citizens. I've been home for seven years and it wasn't until last year that I got housed properly, okay, because of reentry, right? So to me, when you talk about prison abolition, you're also talking about the abolition of other oppressive systems, homelessness, um, racism, classism, sexism. When I talk about prison abolition, to me, it's something that has a multi-layer, it's multi-layered, it's multi-pronged. So when I say we create, we work to create alternatives to incarceration, part of that is working not within the system, but educating the system so that instead of sending someone to prison, when we talk about people who have substance use disorder, you hear this treatment over jails all the time, treatment over incarceration. Well, if we look at trauma, the intersection of trauma and incarceration rates amongst women, girls, and LGBTQ people, specifically people of color, um, what about treatment instead of prisons for someone's trauma, right? Like when I was sentenced, the um, pre-sentencing report came back treatment, right? It said that I have a PTSD from the trauma and you know the judge made that decision to say that I couldn't be treated, right? And um, that means that there's a problem there, right? When you, when you, because when you first come into that, when you first get charged, the option should be what brought this person to the system? What really is a crime? That, that's part of abolition. Like, how do we define crime, right? I define crime as poverty. I define crime as um, homophobia, transphobia. I define crime as sexism, classism, capitalism, colonization. To me, these are crimes, right? So, first, read reimagining what that system is and what are the oppressions that actually put you on that trauma to prison pipeline. Once you analyze this and then you come up with alternatives, like what does it look like to actually heal from trauma instead of putting someone in a carceral space as kind of said, nobody comes out of prison healthier, right? Like, and I'm not even talking about physical health. I'm talking mental health. Like that's, that's paramount, right? Nobody steps out of that prison and walks into a world and is whole and healthy. And the trauma that went untreated prior to prison is exacerbated and then compounded by prison trauma or jail trauma. And so for me, abolition looks like a concurrent sort of planning where while you're on the inside, so we held a, we held a forum um, last week called um, Trauma-Informed Spirituality in Carceral Spaces. And we're not talking like Christian or what have you. It's about holistic approaches, right? Being in tune with something it could be nature, it could be writing, it could be whatever. In this case, it was hosting a former chaplain from Alderson Federal Prison Camp where I was first held. And the whole point of that was to talk about what does it look like to have the gatekeepers on the inside advocating for better treatment, right? Because again, we know that tomorrow they are not going to close down all the prisons. And I can tell you while I was incarcerated and I don't know how what Andrea's experience was because she was in a different space, but I can tell you that none of us thought tomorrow somebody's going to open up that gate and we're going to walk out. But what we did want was better food. What we did want was more programming. What we did want was to be treated like people, like we matter, belong to somebody. What we did want was to be whole, right? We didn't want to be torn down day after day after day. To me, Changing those conditions as we work to free people is a part of prison abolition. I'm a realist when it comes to these things, right? And Andrea, I'm sure you were incarcerated during that time period too when the, the, the crack cocaine law changed, right? And people were literally, they knew the law changed and they were packing their things and calling their families and saying, I'm coming home tomorrow. We all know that wasn't a reality. You, you, they don't change the law and the next day open up the gates, right? 
and 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 it would have been nice to not play with someone's mind like that right it would have been nice to have someone come into the prisons and explain to them what's going to happen so to me prison abolition looks like changing the conditions right offering program that's going to keep you healthy and whole while at the same time those on the outside are doing that work to create alternatives, to educate people about trauma, to educate them about the different oppressions that cause for an educated black woman to be sentenced more than a woman who is not educated because our society says that I should be on crack and that I should have 10 babies and eight baby daddies. And because I don't, that means that I'm a bigger threat to the system, right? So to me, prison abolition, again, it's a very complex, word that has many meanings for different people. For me, it does not mean free them all tomorrow. For me, it means let's work to get people free and let's do this in a systemic, in a way that's sustainable, right? Because let's just think about it. Let's say the prison gates all opened up tomorrow and we said everyone can go free. We're gonna have so many problems because this society does not believe in housing for all. We're gonna have so many problems because this society does not believe in quality health care for all. We're going to have so many problems because right now I can walk out my front door and see people living in tents, right? And, and these are the people the police. Have. So for me, it's creating alternatives to incarceration. It's building a trauma-informed justice system, and it's working from the inside out and the outside in. That's what prison abolition looks like to me. And again, it varies from person to person. We have to honor that journey that people are on as they do this work and recognize that um, to change the system is not a one it's not a one hit, it's not a one hit wonder sort of thing, if that makes sense. I hope that makes sense, what I'm trying to say. This is Lydia. Um, I will uplift a comment that's in our chat from Fern that was, I think, in response to you talking about treatment of psychiatric abolitionism as well, in um, recognizing, you know, for me, prison abolition means abolishing carceral systems which include the systems that result in people being impoverished and homeless and include systems that result in people not being able to receive care and treatment that is on their terms and include systems that talk about treatment but are actually just another form of incarceration um, and another form of institutionalization. So when I think about prison abolition, I believe it is free everybody, free everybody now, free everybody tomorrow, free everybody right now. And part of freedom is make sure that everybody has what they need, make sure that everybody has housing, make sure that everybody has support. And we don't have that in our society, but that is part of the problem of carcerality. And it's part of the problem of the violent, ableist, racist society we find ourselves in. Um, I will turn to Gabrielle next um, on talking about abolition. And, um, and then if folks have questions, like I hope you do, please feel free to add those into our uh, chat or on Twitter, and we will try to bring in some questions from you all as well. Uh, Gabriel. Um, this is Gabriel. I love hearing people's definitions of abolition because I think everyone says it and thinks of it a little bit differently. And I feel like all of those visions are a gift. Um, uh, so I'll try not to repeat too much, but. But to me, it is, it is about ending policing, prosecution, imprisonment, and punishment, and replacing them with justice, care, interdependence, and accountability. Um, and by prisons, I don't just mean, uh, you know, literal state or federal prisons, but also um, any facilities where people are held against their will, whether it's, you know, court-mandated residential drug treatment facilities or nursing homes or residential treatment facilities or locked um, psych, uh, psych treatment wings and hospitals or whatever else it is. Um, and then it also means dismantling, as I think uh, Lydia was saying, um, everything that makes those systems work, you know, whether we're from racism to rape culture, like all of it, and transforming the ways we distribute resources um, and relate to one another, which I, I think is related to what Taylor was saying. So it really touches on everything, every aspect of how we organize society. Um, and I first, when I first started um, thinking of myself as an abolitionist, I was thinking of abolition as this conception of our goal, 
um, understanding it may take a while to get there, um, but that abolition was the end point. Um, and then other, other folks taught me to see it also as a strategy and a process. So it's not just about where we end up, it's about what we're doing today, how we're treating one another, how we're living our values. Um, and then as I've looked more historically at um, imprisonment and, and other, you know, big, terrible things like slavery, imperialism, and so forth, I've also come to think of it as something that we need to defend. Um, so even if we did achieve abolition one day, doesn't mean it's going to stay there without a lot of work to keep it there because there are always going to be forces that are trying to push us in a different direction. Um, and so, so I think people are doing abolition, like so many different things can be doing abolition. It can be advocating for housing for all. It can be apologizing when we mess up. It can be letting someone stay with us if they're fleeing violence. It can be posting bail for someone. It can be starting a pen pal relationship with someone who's incarcerated. Uh, it can be fighting against these, um, you know, there's there have been so many state bills that are about abortion criminalization, trans healthcare criminalization, criminalization of, um, of protest, I mean, further criminalization. All of these are further. <laughs> like, it's not like, um, abortion and trans healthcare aren't already criminalized in some context, but it's all about intensifying the criminalization of protesting, of getting trans healthcare or being trans in the world, of getting abortion, um, expansion of criminalization of voting, um, particularly voting while black. Um, like all of these things I think are, are work that are that is really relevant to abolition, that is a type of abolitionist work. Um, and, and to make it a little more concrete, if we just think about some of the situations, like some of the ones that I, that I or other folks have mentioned, like if we think about um, you know, my client who was arrested at a Black Trans Lives Matter vigil, um, and then uh, I won't go into details, but really targeted for horrifyingly abusive treatment. Um, if we imagine like what would we want, what would we, what would that have looked like in an abolitionist world? Like we would have started with, well, there wouldn't be these murders of black trans women. Um, if a black trans woman was murdered, then there would be so, so many resources for her friends and family and communities. There'd be so many resources for trying to prevent this sort of violence from ever happening again. There would be so much resources for, um, for people who wanna take accountability for violence that they've done. Um, so there wouldn't have had to be the protest, but if there was a protest, that it wouldn't have been criminalized. So the police wouldn't have swept in and arrested everyone. Um, and we don't even get to the part where um, we're there in jail and they're getting singled out for all of these um, forms of violence because of who they are. Um, and if they did experience trauma like that, then they would have so many resources afterwards to recover. They would have people bringing them food. They would have, um, you know, they wouldn't have had to worry about the fact that they wanted to go back to therapy, but they couldn't afford it. Right. So. I, it's just like at every at every point along the stream, um, we want to try to change the conditions so that the harm never happens in the first place. But if harm does happen, then then people aren't left alone to deal with it. Um, and you can do the same for for any number of other types of situations like that. Thank you so much for sharing um, about that. Um, Andrea, I'd like to turn to you next. Um, if you would talk about abolition and what that means for you as an intersectional concept and, and movement. Well, uh, for us, abolition um, does refer to ending the use of prisons, the casserole system, doing that with uh, the immediacy that that 
we ask, however, realizing that prisons aren't going to close their doors tomorrow at the rate that we need that to happen. We think of abolition as um, eliminating police in our communities and the creation of what different looks like is how we phrase it. We consider abolition to mean the end of incarceration, that things like ankle shackles, electronic monitoring are not forms of what we refer to as non-reformist reform. We know that we must do things that are considered still within the realm of criminal legal reform because we have our loved ones who are inside of cages, who are living inside of prisons, who are living inside of other uh, places that um, are, have been uh, caught up in this web of, of the carceral system. And so we have to continue to work within that current system, but we do it through the lens of non-reformist reform meaning do these things that we're fighting for, not uh, that we not do that with carve outs. That's why we do a lot of policy work. An example I'll give you is the First Step Act. We worked like hell to um, uh, at least get what was literally a uh, casserole capitalist bill, which was being touted as the next great step towards uh, criminal legal reform, which none of that was true. Um, we still worked within that to create uh, the retroactivity, something outside of prison reform that um, we could get into the bill. Um, and we did that work to make sure that what um, Taylor had, had, had referenced uh, was the, the closure, uh, not even one to one, which is just astounding to me, but the 18 to one down from 100 to one disparities in the crack cocaine sentences. And, you know, we, we had to go to the mat to even get that included in what they were referring to as the First Step Act. And then, of course, uh, the, the, the Trump administration went about making sure that whatever small uh, uh, opportunities uh, were created out of the First Step Act that um, they they closed that op those opportunities off, um, but that's that's so when we have to work within the system, for instance, we do it uh, uh, only through the lens of non-reformist reform. So the First Step Act, in addition to it being a carceral capitalist bill, it also left out uh, two and a half pages of carve outs, which the people who needed to benefit from what it was providing most those people were completely left out. And what it effectuated was 75% uh, black people serving federal sentences who found no relief as a result of the First Step Act. So it was not considered at all a non-reformist ref uh, piece of legislation. So we, we start by asking those kinds of questions. Um, to make sure that we're doing it through an abolitionist lens. Um, so an abolition as well as what Gabriel pointed out uh, means to us also what we're building. Abolition is about building. Abolition is not, we, we tend to have a focus on you know, the system while we're talking about abolition, but abolition is about building. It's about what we are creating. It's about experimentation. Um, uh, as well as stopping prisons. They, we say, well, we can't shut the prisons down tomorrow, but yet they will commit $50 million to a new women's prison for 139 women in Massachusetts, something that we just uh, uh, worked really hard to derail. They will come up with money um, to build three mega prisons in Alabama, something that we just derailed. However, now the governor of Alabama, uh, Kay Ivey, is using COVID uh, relief money uh, now, because we were able to get all of the investors in the prison to to uh, back out of building that new prison, and so we do we do mean it when we say abolition. We mean we believe in 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 taking resources 
ending law enforcement in our communities and creating what different looks like for transformative justice, for actually creating those systems that allow for individual and community accountability, individual and community accountability, and how do we go about achieving those goals and um, uh, a reallocation of investment into people and into our neighborhoods um, and into our families repealing of the Adoption Safe Family Act. We often concentrate on the 1994 Crime Act. We don't consider the incredible amount of disruption that and harm and trauma that has been caused uh, by another act under the Clinton administration, which is the Adoption of Safe Families Act and the, the absolute uh, uh, devastation and, and, and break uh, stealing of predominantly black children of, of women, which never took into consideration the time frame because of incarceration. And as Taylor will, will remember, there are women in the federal system who have no idea because they're in the federal system with so little access to state uh, 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 ways to fight state cases and, and, and family law is in the state jurisdictions that come to our bunks and, and in tears because the only uh, recognition they have, the only, the only indication they have is a letter from a state family court saying you have permanently lost custody of your children. So all of those systems that have caused so much harm, we do demand an immediate end to those while we are building and creating and experimenting because we know that prisons don't cause public safety, don't create it, uh, thriving communities create thriving people that create um, the, the opportunity for us to build and, and live and thrive. So thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, I shared a quote from abolitionist scholar, Ruth Wilson Gilmore in the chat, abolition is a project of presence, not absence, which to me is a really critical reminder that of what I think all of us have talked about in some form or another, that abolition isn't simply the absence of prisons and incarceration, but it is also the presence of housing, the presence of safety as defined by those most impacted, the presence of autonomy, the presence of care, and so on. Um, Kana, um, I'll turn to you as our last guest to address this topic, and then we will transition to the um, final portion of our conversation. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll keep, I think, my comments short. I want to um, just repeat too much of what um, you know others have already lifted up. I think um, one speaking to this, um, the point of presence and of building, um, just centering that abolition is a plurality, as Joy James teaches us. Um, a process, right? A constellation of activities that builds communal power. And for example, for us, um, what that looks like is identifying urban farms, especially those working towards Black food sovereignty as sites of resistance under food apartheid. Um, and, and ones that um, are using food to um, build towards self-determination. Um, I think I, I also, when I use the word abolition, I look to it in its most radical form. Um, just something I want to, yeah, just just touch on is that, you know, especially after last year and after abolition jumped into the mainstream, um, there's been so many attempts um, from all sides to really de-radicalize the true meaning of abolition and pare it down, right, to its most visible forms of um, oppression, aka the institutions of policing and prisons. Um, so, as, you know, as others have said, just, um, again, lifting up um, all of the various forms of carcerality um, that are in place in the society. Um, and I think there's a good divide here between um, what a friend and a comrade Shimon um, outlines between reformist abolition and revolutionary abolition. So kind of taking the notion of reformist reforms and non-reformist reforms one step further. So I think in this case, when we're talking about revolutionary abolition, um, really talking about racial capitalism, imperialism, patriarchy, ableism, and ultimately the nation state itself. Um, just looking at, again, food, water, air, land, under capitalism, how they're producing um, incredibly unhealthy societies. So I think, of course, abolition means taking down prisons, jails, hospitals, psych institutions, mandatory drug rehab centers, and all carceral institutions. Um, 
which also means bringing in an analysis of the nonprofit industrial complex, but also our food system, right? One that is a carceral system in itself. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I, look at, I look at what carcerality has done to our social relationships between ourselves, between other people, between food and land, and how they've just been ruptured through centuries of oppression. Um, and I think just, again, centering, going a step further and looking at U.S. imperialism, this also does mean uprooting U.S. empire, right, and capitalist social relationships in themselves. And as someone pointed out um, in the chat, it's also not a uniquely U.S. phenomenon, right? We're talking about the global north um, and all forms of imperialism, too. So I think to go back to this word of uh, plurality, for me, abolition has to be paired with alternate political visions, right? Ones that are rooted in the abolition of all forms of um, hierarchy and oppression. Um, yeah. This is Lydia. Um, the last question that I want to invite each of you to share, and again, if folks who are participating today, if you have questions, please share them, um, and we'll try to amplify if we have time. Um, my last question that I want to pose to you is, can you talk about how your work has addressed the impact of the pandemic on incarcerated people and their access to food and to healthcare and how folks who would like to work in solidarity or partnership with directly impacted people can do so? Since there's probably a lot of people here who are wondering just that, like, what could I do to support your work and the work of people who are currently informally incarcerated. And for this, let's go back to Andrea to start. I'll, I'll be as brief as possible. Our, our work um, lives in, um, our everyday work lives in the same space. And so we, we really had to scramble, however, formerly incarcerated women are the last hired and the first fired even outside of a pandemic. The pandemic for us was is prisons and incarceration. And so we we entered into uh into into what entered into that already existing pandemic was now a pandemic that was uh health related in uh, this this virus. What women showed up at jobs that were already unsustainable, were already not paying them living wages, uh, were already not providing them with fair uh, uh, opportunity uh, to provide health care for their children and their families and themselves, for instance. And, and, and early on in the pandemic, they discovered that those uh, businesses were shuttered. They then went home and found their children sitting on the stoop because the schools had sent them home. And then uh, these systems made a demand on uh, these women to now provide remote learning for children in households that already were experiencing um, the, 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 uh, the, the, the uh, lack of connectivity to the digital uh, uh, tools in order to make that possible. Um, these are women who are already relying upon uh, edu uh, uh, the education system to help them with breakfast and lunch for their children. Um, these are women who are already in a state of uh, uh, struggle to keep lights on already, um, you know, uh, um, uh, figuring out how to throw the extension cord down the fire escape to the sister below them to keep the, to keep the lights on when it was their turn to not be able to meet a phone bill and a light bill. Uh, uh, many times a phone bill exacerbated because of an incarcerated loved one because they are uh, uh, gouging and allowing for uh, this carceral capitalist system to work by charging families uh, astronomical amounts to communicate. And so the women were already in a state of struggle. And then the pandemic came along and left them without even more. And we had to really uh, shift um, to uh, pushing out whatever it didn't require, which we do on a regular basis anyway, just to keep the lights on in our own shop, to really begin to shore up and to, and to expand, rapidly expand two areas. One was our mutual aid and the other was our basic income guarantee. Um, and we've done that um, and continue to do that because, um, and that covers everything from <laughs> paying light bills, rent, food, and we, we made an investment in hydroponic farms. And so we're using these freight farms to grow food year round in communities that 
um, do not have fresh produce and berries. And we're experimenting with what you can actually grow beyond the traditional things that grow inside of a, a, a hydroponic freight farm and, 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 and taking investments to make sure that, you know, uh, people have, it's really down to the basics um, and really uh, hyper-locally organizing in very small radiuses, 10, five, 10 blocks at a time to saturate our communities with resources and opportunity to organize and to, and to eat and to eat, to feed our people. Um, would you know provide basic dignity? We're thinking about environment green projects. You know how do we <laughs> literally you know create opportunities for these sisters to to own energy, own energy, um, and then create a, a residual income off of the excess energy that is produced. And so all of these things is part of abolition and all of this experimentation that we're doing. Thank you for sharing about that work, Andrea. And if you have other links where we can go uh, or where folks can go to learn more, um, definitely make sure to share those. We will be emailing everybody um, all of the links and resources that have been shared and discussed following the webinar so that folks will be able to come back. Um, I'll turn to Kanav next. Yeah, so when the, when the pandemic hit, our in-person work, um, prisons just shut everything down. Um, you know, folks were on lockdown in many places. They still are on lockdown for 23 hours a day. And our pilot program, you know, we were given just so many reasons, all of them illogical for why that had to end. Um, just like so deeply <laughs> illogical. Um, so what we had to do was really kind of pivot to more, advocacy and research and political education. And one part of that was understanding in times of crisis, um, food conditions, especially on the inside are one of the first things to worsen. Um, so we really wanted to understand, okay, what is the impact the pandemic is having on um, carceral food? Um, and as expected, um, you know, I'm sure in all parts of the country, but especially in Maryland, things got even worse. Um, things got unimaginably worse, you know, um, People were being fed barely two times a day, tiny portions, cold food delivered to their cells. Um, you know, the, the ways in which um, those meals, again, exacerbated um, and created uh, mental illnesses um, as well. Um, and then on top of that, just the ways in which prisons were responding to COVID and throwing people in solitary, not feeding people on the inside to a point where um, folks sometimes didn't even when they were feeling um you know of course the like the deeply um intense uh physical consequences of covid didn't even share that with prison staff and just you know as, as one comrade told us what what happened is when people were sharing that they had covid they were taken out of their cell into a makeshift tent um, outside the prison and this is like october november right so it's you know it's maryland it's cold People are being shackled to beds and just being like force fed um, this really horrible food and then just given maybe a Tylenol, maybe an Advil. Right. So so for us, again, just like like just like dissecting the ways in which food forms this through line of all of these various forms of oppression on the inside. So we put out a zine um, in August of last year that kind of speaks to food conditions on the inside due to COVID. You know, I'll, I'll share that link um, with folks, too. Um, and in terms of the second part of the question of, um, you know, what what folks can do to support, you know, there's been so much amazing mutual aid work happening around food specifically and in places like Baltimore. Um, so I'm also happy to share links to organizations um, who are doing that work, such as Black Yield Institute, you know, we're in deep community with the Black Church Food Security Network, um, et cetera. So I'll, I'll post, um, I'll share some of those resources um, that Lydia, maybe you can share out with folks as well. This is Lydia. We will share those resources out. So thank you for sharing them with us. Um, we will turn next to Taylor for this question. So, you know, during COVID, I started doing this hashtag beyond COVID because everyone knows that the conditions existed for COVID to wreak havoc on carceral spaces. COVID didn't create the unsanitary and unhealthy conditions. It just 
put a spotlight on it, right? Because we weren't having an epidemic like when we have the flu virus, the new, the newest flu that's come out for the season. We were in a pandemic, right? And so, for example, my last um, few months, my I've never had the flu in my life until I got to prison. Um, but that January, I was released that June. It was when we had this big flu epidemic, and um, I was had been shipped to a higher security prison where they actually keep you in cells um because at Alderson federal prison camp you're not locked in and so i got the flu and um they were doing this thing where if you had a bunkie right and that's what the women call their celly or the person that's on the bunk above them um hence andrea's book a <laughs> bunkie tonight um they would they were doing this thing where they would come in and if you had a high fever right if you exhibiting signs of the flu they would move you to a different cell right but they would then lock your bunk in who had no signs for five to seven days but as soon as your fever broke in two to three days you got out right so this created infighting right it means that people were just like saying you better not tell you have a fever you better not tell you have a fever right and of course i got sick i got sick and i went to ask the correction officer something and i don't know what i was saying i had a temperature of 103 i think and he was like, Nouvelle, you're going to medical. And they were keeping med at the women's prisons. They never keep medical open past a certain time, right? Like Andrew can tell you this. They, they send them home on the weekends. You're screwed. But for the flu, and I'm sure they did this during the pandemic, during, during for COVID to do this, the, the, the medical was open 24 hours and they would send you over, take your temperature. And then they locked me in my cell. And at that time, I didn't have a bunkie. So they put me in with someone else and they wouldn't unlock our cells. They would put this disgusting food in through the the i call it a slaw and they would um leave you in there with this food that smells horrible and they wouldn't allow you to have tylenol or anything because they were like that'll trick your fever so they actually searched our cell and our things before we were put into the lockdown and they took anything we had that would ease our pain you know and um it not only did it create this infighting but it also made other people because they had to let us out to shower so they would lock everybody down and let us come out and shower <laughs> and people would be yelling at us that we were disgusting we were gross as if getting a communicable disease was um getting a virus made you somehow bad right so when COVID hit i was just like this is going to really wreak havoc on the system so who speaks for me geared ourselves up and there were a couple of things in dc we wanted to do one we have something here called central cell block and that's where when you are detained, the, when you get arrested, you're taken in DC to a station. And from the station, you're taken to this huge building called Central Cell Block, and you're put into DC or DOC custody. And this place is riddled with roaches. Before the pandemic, you didn't get soap, you didn't get hygiene, nothing, right? So like we know hepatitis is rampant amongst people who are in carceral spaces because of shared needles and so on and so forth. And it is contagious right so these are things that i used to worry about all the time right so when when close when when the pandemic hit who speaks for me started a campaign called closed central cell block because it's not rehabilitated the way that it's done is not good and we are in the midst of that campaign right now and it, it COVID gave us the the light to sh we've been talking for years about central cell block but because of COVID, we can say the majority of people that are arrested come from wards seven and eight our most impoverished wards in dc those people go back to their communities right so if you're arresting hundreds of people taking in the central cell block no mask no nothing right no hygiene no hand sanitizer and then you're putting them back in the community what you see is that the highest rates of COVID were in ward seven and eight right so that's what we've started to do we also recognize you know, one of the systems of the trauma to prison pipeline is being unhoused. So we started taking our work to the shelters where unhoused women were um, and taking hand sanitizer, mask um, and, and food. We were getting food catered by like Ivy City Smokehouse and other places to feed people because, you know, they weren't allowed to leave the shelters really. There was no place to go because everything was shut down. So we were bringing things to them. Um, and then we started working at the halfway house as well to make sure people had sanitary napkins because they couldn't go out the women could not go out they were locking them in and saying you can't go see your children you can't go do this so we had to take things through to them but the thing is is that 
having access to these things has always been a problem. If you come home and you don't have money or you're locked down in a carceral space. And, um, and so COVID, I know this sounds bizarre, was kind of a gift because it did some amazing things. One, it showed us that we don't have to lock people up, right? They let people go home early from prison, right? And even though we don't like it, Andrea, you know, it's a process, right? It's like the lesser of two evils, right? You're like, okay, we want to get rid of ankle monitors, but if this will get you out of that institution and into your house, we'll take that for now, right? And then we'll come for you later about that. So we saw people released, not sent to halfway houses, they were sent home to home confinement, which gave them a little bit more freedom, right? And if we can do that during COVID, we can do that period. So COVID has been a jumping off point for Who Speaks For Me. We're saying, if you can arrest fewer people during COVID, which they've been doing here in DC under site and release, then going forward, you don't need to be arresting people. You can cite people and release them. And that's that's another way of doing prison abolition. That's another way of keeping people in the community and proving that it's not the carceral space that rehabilitates. It's not the carceral space that keeps our community safe, right? It's about what's in the community. And because of mutual aid, right? Because mutual aid has kicked off, people are being cited and released and they're in their community and we're providing food, right? We have these whole networks that we did behind the scenes to make sure black, black and brown people were getting the, the immunizations before they opened it up to everyone, right? So we really use that networking opportunity to help and to, to sort of punch those systems of oppression in the face and say, COVID has shown us that we can do things differently. And I think that's that's the crux of it. We're going to close in for cell block and we've been raising awareness about the food justice. So I think um, while many people have died and I don't mean it's a gift in that way, I mean, it's been a conduit, if you will, a catalyst to to, to stop us from screaming into a hollow space and be able to say, see, this is what we were telling you, right? We knew you could do it. And it's sad that it took this many deaths for you to step up and say, okay, you're right. We have to do something. And that, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for sharing that, Taylor. I mean, just the atrocities and the casual inhumanity that happens constantly in carceral spaces is never surprising, but it is always fucking infuriating and just more evidence why we need to disappear um, those systems. Um, last on this question, we'll turn to Gabrielle and then we'll wrap up with the announcement for our next program in the series um, as we are very close to being at our time. Um, Gabrielle. Hi, this is Gabrielle. Um, yeah, so this is getting me thinking back to the very beginning of the pandemic um, and you know, right away, what we were seeing was um, for trans people on the outside, there was often a really drastic loss in income. Um, they've It's now been long enough that they've done studies to prove when in fact we knew that um, trans people and LGBT people generally were particularly hard hit by um, by job loss and other financial loss. And a lot of our folks make money to live through sex work and these are small business owners who are not eligible for any of the relief right because it's criminalized work um so a lot of our sex worker communities in particular were really really struggling some were able tra to transition to cam work but you know not everyone right um so a lot of a lot of mutual aid projects getting set up um some of which are still around some of which have have dwindled, which is unfortunate because we still really need them. Um, we also saw, um, and we also saw a huge impact on people's access to healthcare. Um, and this was in prisons and outside of them, right? Um, so anything other than than care related to COVID was deprioritized across the board, and so for our folks who often need access to gender affirming care. Many of us also need HIV meds. Many of us also need psych meds. Um, like there were there were often interruptions, um, delays in people being able to get refills um, and get medications they need. A lot of people dealing with withdrawal symptoms um, and or you know increased viral loads, other sorts of difficult things as they were not having a, an okay time getting access to what they needed um, and. And while that 
eventually, I think, mostly evened out. There's still significant delays for people who wanted to, who need, who wanted or needed to start care for the first time, um, as opposed to just continue care that they were already getting. And interestingly, well, in trans surgery dates were often pushed off a lot. So there were a lot of people who were um, suffering without access to surgical surgical care for a long time. But sometimes there was actually the reverse, where surgeons who were experiencing a loss in their income really wanted to encourage people to get um, surgery because they wanted to make more money. Um, and so they were offering people discounted rates if they would come in for surgery right away, um, which a, a lot of people did. And that's that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it's great to be able to get surgery when you need it and for less money. Um, but it did sort of create this pressure for some people to get surgery before they had done all of the treatment beforehand that would have allowed them to get the best results. Um, so it, it ended up that some people got surgical care that could have been a lot better if it hadn't been quite so rushed. Um, that I will say is outside of prisons. Trans people just across the board do not get access to gender affirming surgery in prison. I mean, people have been fighting and there are now a few very rare exceptions, but it is still by far, most people are not able to get access to surgical care in prison for gender dysphoria. Um, in terms of folks in prisons, you know, I will, I like many other lawyers, um, you know, dove into to, um, litigating cases to try to get uh, particularly people with chronic illnesses out of prisons. We had some early successes in those cases, but especially as time went on and the cases made their way up to appeals courts, we had a ton, a ton of losses. Um, with uh, And you can really see some of the problems with the legal frameworks um, for people in prison in this situation, because um, so, so the typical standard is you have to show that they were deliberately indifferent um, to a serious medical need. And uh, what the courts were saying was, well, they're not deliberately indifferent. In fact, plaintiffs themselves say that there's no way to make a prison safe in COVID-19. So it's just that it's impossible. It's not that they're doing anything wrong. Therefore, there's no violation. Um, so the courts weren't saying, oh, no, it's okay if we can keep people in prison and they won't die of COVID. They were saying it doesn't matter that keeping them in prison means they're going to die of COVID. Um, and we did see many, many deaths of COVID and, and certainly in trans communities. I mean, trans communities, unfortunately, I think are, are not unfamiliar with people dying relatively young in our communities, but um, the COVID brought on a lot of those deaths and a lot of what I and other folks were doing was just making funeral arrangements for people, right? Um, and then also um, in prisons, I mean, one of the first things I thought about it was a, a client from a long time ago who was a trans woman in a men's prison who was not allowed to take a shower because um, the guard said that she would be disruptive there because she's a woman. Um, and she didn't even have a working sink in her cell. So she had literally no way to wash it all. She couldn't take a shower. She couldn't even wash her face or hands um, because they just, they, they wouldn't let her do it. Um, and I, it took me months of advocacy to get them to fix the sink and let her take a shower. Like you have to go to a lawyer for months to be able to wash your face. Um, so, I mean, as folks have said, like these are already horribly unhygienic systems and where trans people in particular have a really hard time getting access to hygiene. Um, and where now that's going to be even deadlier than it has been. Um, and then there's also one of my clients who was arrested at that Black Trans Lives Matter vigil. Um, and when they were taken in, somebody was looking at one of the guards thought, hmm, is this person trans? and actually pulled their mask off their face and scrutinized them really closely, trying to look for facial hair or some other sign of masculinity. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that person, they got COVID. Um, 
I I mean, maybe they would have gotten COVID even if they hadn't done that. But even the basic measure of being able to wear your own mask that you came in with was not allowed to continue because they were suspected of being trans. Um, I'll also say, you know, I'm, I'm, so it's, I really recommend that people take a look at the Herd video series on the experiences of deaf people in prison during COVID. Um, they're really excellent and point out a lot of a lot of problems that I hadn't thought of as a hearing person, including the move to video hearings and all of the problems with interpretation in that setting. If there's a little glitch with a video, you could miss something that is absolutely crucial to your case um, and a whole host of other things too. Um, so I recommend that. And one last thing on COVID that you know, that there's been so much focus on masks and vaccines and they do matter, like they definitely matter a lot. Um, but I, there's also something that's a little bit concerning or frustrating to me that it's, it ends up being a very individualized focus. Like, are you wearing a mask? Are you getting vaccinated? And there's not a looking at the, like the really big systems here. Like if we want to be COVID and not have, future similar pandemics, we absolutely need everyone to have access to housing, not being packed into homeless shelters. We absolutely need decarceration. We cannot keep warehousing people in nursing homes or prisons or jails. Um, And we absolutely need to look at our food systems too. Um, And the practice of factory farming, if you have that many animals packed together, it also creates more opportunities for illness to spread, which can jump to humans. The the people who work in our food industry tend to be incredibly exploited and treated poorly. Um, You know, we need to look, we need to look much more systemically about our practices that are both, they're cruel and oppressive. They make us vulnerable to pandemics. And um, sorry, (laughs) I'll wrap up. Um, and, and they're terrible for the climate too. Um, and for recommendations of what to do, um, I will say uh, that um, there are lots of great organizations to support. Um, I recommend taking a look at the Trans Week of um, Visibility and Action has a lot of things about how to fight anti-trans bills. I recommend going to Black and Pink and looking at becoming a pen pal. Um, and also the folks in Texas have said that um, that one of the biggest things that they're dealing with with the child removal of um, of trans kids with supportive parents is just the flood of disinformation. Um, so elevating the elevating just retweeting, sharing whatever unsocial messages from local trans led groups in Texas is incredibly helpful because it just helps fight some of the disinformation that is causing even more panic. Um, sorry for going on so long. Thanks. This is Lydia. Thank you so much to all four of you for sharing your experiences and your work. Um, I'm really glad that we were able to have this conversation. Uh, For those of you that are joining us, uh, we have three exciting programs coming up in April. Uh, The first is on April 1st, and it is our kickoff event for Autism Acceptance Month. Uh, That will be uh, April 1st, featuring three contributors to AWN's anthology, Sincerely, Your Autistic Child, uh, including um, work from Marenike Giwa Onaiwu, M-O-R-E-N-I-K-E, Giwa, G-I-W-A, Onaiwu, O-N-A-I-W-U, Victoria, Rodriguez Roldan, R-O-L-D-A-N, and Cassiana Asasimas, K-A-S-S-I-A-N-E, A-S-A-S-U-M-A-S-U. Following that, our next program will be addressing Accountable Disability Journalism on April 13th. And on April 24th, we will be hosting a program on cultural work, 
visual art, and disability justice. We hope that you will join us for our next liberating webinars. The information to register is on our website or will be shortly. And thank you again to Andrea, Taylor, Kanav, and Gabriel, to our interpreters, Genesee and Sarika, and to our captioner, as well as to AWN's team, Kate, Kaylee, Nancy, and all others who helped to make our webinar, webinar programming possible. Thank you and have a fantastic rest of your Sunday afternoon.